All right, hello everyone who might be turning, tuning in early. We're gonna wait a couple more minutes until two to get started. So just settle in, maybe get a piece of paper and a pen so you can keep track of your score. Realize now that I was not sharing my screen. Hang on a second. <laughs> All right. If you're tuning in, uh, we'll be getting started right at two o'clock. So I think we have about five or 10 minutes. Um, so go ahead and settle in and get yourself a pen and some paper, maybe, to write down how many questions you get right or notes, you know, whatever floats your boat. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started right at two. In the meantime, um, if you have any pre-existing questions that you'd like to ask about local history or working in museums or the Clark Museum or Humboldt County or anything like that, feel free to put it in the comments section and I will do my best to answer it. Hope y'all are getting a chance to go outside and check out the nice weather we've been having. Um, I know I definitely have when I take my little breaks here at, while I'm working, I'll go for a little walk around Old Town and it's starting to come back to life just a little bit. <laughs> um, well, substantially more than it was, you know, a couple of weeks ago, or a couple months ago. Um, but it's kind of nice to start seeing things opening back up, um, you know while also everyone's being safe at the same time, so. So I guess while we wait just a couple more minutes um, to get started, uh, if you guys wanna put in the comments what you've been doing now that it's kind of the heyday of summertime, you can see what people are up to been pretty it's been I don't know if I'd say it's been pretty busy but it has been a definite uptick in people visiting the museum since we opened on Wednesday um, so it's pretty promising to see people coming in learning about some history um, so I know I've been spending a lot of time hanging out outside getting a nice tan remembering what it's like to put sunscreen on again. <laughs> so 
So I guess a couple of things as we kind of wait to get to two o'clock here. Um, we're trying to do these trivia games about once a month. So um, I think the last one was at the end of the month. This one's mid month. Um, so keep an eye out. We'll try to do it at least once a month. Um, they're definitely a lot of fun for me to put together. Um, I get to learn something new whenever I get one of these trivia things put together. Um, and if there's any categories you think would be exciting to explore, feel free to let me know. Um, I just kind of pick these out of my brain or whatever I'm researching at the time um, or events going on or things like that. So it's kind of a mixed bag. For those of you tuning in, we're gonna get started in about two minutes. Um, a lot of times when you're watching these videos, there's a little share button. If you want your friends to participate, there's a way to invite them. It's on the right side of the screen, under where it says Clark Historical Museum is live now. There's a little spot where you can invite your friends. You can also hit share. Um, you can also like the video. That has an impact on how Facebook functions. So invite your friends, see who's got the who's got the local trivia brain in your friend group. One more minute here. I turned this on a little bit early this time um, to give people a chance to kind of come across it rather than us being halfway through it and then people start seeing it. So, um, so get out your pens and papers to keep track of your score. We also have one of our staff members is on the video. Her name's Dana. She'll also be keeping score. Um, so yeah, and at the end of this, um, the person with the highest score gets a membership to the Clark Museum. So be sure to keep your score and we'll see who wins. And if you already have a membership to the museum, you can also gift it to someone else if you happen to win. Um, share the local history love. All right, so it's two o'clock. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name's Katie and I'm the interim director curator at the Clark Museum. Um, if you've been tuning in with us over the course of the pandemic, you're probably very familiar with my voice. Um, today we're going to be doing summertime trivia. So these are today's categories. We got maritime, celebrations, trains, 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 local flora and fauna, um, and parks. All right, so let's go ahead and check it out. First category, maritime. So of course, things having to do with boats and the ocean. So the first one, First question is, this shipyard, which was located in Fairhaven, employed around 150 workers who built sh ships integral to the Pacific Coast lumber trade. Was it Cousins, Ben Dixon, Hammond, or Excelsior? I'll give you a little bit of time here to drop your answer in the comments. So this shipyard, which was located in Fairhaven, employed around 150 workers who built ships integral to the Pacific Coast lumber trade. And something that you might find surprising is that there were a good number of um, Shipyards right on Humboldt Bay. So we have a guess for C. Hammond. Um, and Humboldt Bay was a pretty happening place when it came to shipbuilding um, in the heyday of um, the redwood lumber trade, particularly before trains. Um, the only way to really get massive amounts of lumber out of Humboldt County before the trains and the railroads came in was by boat. So it was really important to have those good shipyards. So if anyone else wants to guess, be sure to put it in the comments there so we can see it. Okay. 
Had a pretty quiet voting crowd today. So the answer is Ben Dixon. And this is a picture of one of the ships and some of the shipbuilding crew out with Ben Dixon. And he actually became a pretty notable shipbuilder in Humboldt County, um, which is pretty incredible. Um, Cousins was another ship uh, shipyard. Um, Hammond, so A.B. Hammond was a local lumber baron type. Um, he did also build ship, or he did have a shipbuilding component of his company. It was kind of this vertical, vertical, uh, vertical, sorry, integration where he would build, you know, he'd not only log the stuff, but he'd put it on a ship um, and he controlled his shipping trades as well. And Excelsior was a mill that was located um, here in Humboldt County. All right, so the next one is the Humboldt Bay Life Saving Station, now operated by the Coast Guard, is a unique example for Coast Guard stations due to it being the only operating station in the country with this feature. A, Roosevelt architecture, B, original floor plan, C, a marine railway, or D, original lifeboats are still in use. This here is a picture of some Coast Guard, I believe they're Coast Guard, either that or Navy, um, guys marching down the street um, near what is, or near Myrtle Grove Cemetery, you can recognize the fence there. So the Humboldt Bay Life Saving Station. If you haven't seen this station, it's really cool. It's out in Samoa. Um, it's a beautiful building. Any guesses, go ahead and put them in the comments. Humboldt Bay Life Saving Station. David guesses C, Marine Railway. We got a guess for B, original floor plan. So the answer is Marine Railway. So if you've been checking up on um, some of our local media outlets, I know Lost Coast Outpost ran a story on it. Um, there's a kind of a movement right now to remove the Marine Railway from the Coast Guard station. Um, and there's been a lot kind of written about why it's important to keep it. Um, but what was really important about this marine railway, and I wish I had a picture of it, um, is that it would take the boats from being on land into the water within a matter of, well, less, maybe like, you know, a minute or two, because the boats would be up and then they'd be taken down this railway straight into the water and then they could be dispatched to help people in shipwrecks, which there were a ton of shipwrecks here in Humboldt, right next to, um, right there on the bay. Um, and there is another station in California, I believe, that does still have the Marine Railway, but the Coast Guard station that that one is at is no longer operating. So that's why this particular Marine Railway is special because it is still an operating station. Um, and the Roosevelt architecture is the actual architecture of the building. Uh, the floor plan has been modified quite a bit. And the original lifeboats are not still in use. Here's a picture of one of them. Now I believe they're metal boats and that they're easier to move around, which kind of led to the um, decline of marine railway uses. Probably one of the most well-known groundings of a ship in Humboldt County was the grounding of the USS Milwaukee, which became stuck in the sand off of Samoa while attempting to rescue this submarine, which had also gotten stuck in the sand. What's the name of the submarine? Is it Marianne, HB7, Red October, or H3? This is a picture of that submarine. Um, I never really looked into how exactly they got the submarine off of the beach, but it looks here like they attached a piece of wood to it and kind of had it up on some blocks, maybe so when the tide came in, it could be carried back out, um, which is sort of what ended up happening. <laughs> um, so we have one guest that says, I so want it to be Red October. And then someone else says, haha, Red October, that's funny. Yeah, I was trying to come up with um, 
some challenging answers and some maybe not so challenging answers. <laughs> All right. The hunt is over. <laughs> we have a guess for, we have two guesses for B. So let's see. It's actually D. So very close. Um, HB7 was not a um, uh, submarine. <laughs> it was called H3. I'm not really sure what the H stands for, but here's another picture of that same submarine on the same beach and some people standing around. You'll notice um, Mercer Fraser, Mercer, Mercer, goodness. Mercer Frazier, sorry, I've been having a weird time talking today, um, had a sign on the side of the um, submarine. So they were the company that helped to get it off of the beach. And it did, I believe, end up washing back out into the ocean and it could you know, steer itself away, but uh, the Milwaukee ended up getting uh, stuck. <laughs> oh, so here's another kind of angle of the grounding. Um, <laughs> And look at all these people coming out and checking it out um, on the beach. So this is that's still the submarine when it was still kind of underwater. Um, pretty incredible. It was a big scene to have um, something like this happen. <laughs> um, pretty crazy. All right, now our next category is celebrations. So of course we all, like to celebrate the summertime and all the events that happen during the summertime. So let's check out some of these past ones. So this event, which was first hosted by Stanwood S. Schmidt, Schmidt nah, was a renowned reproductive urologist and botanist in 1968, celebrates a native flower of the Pacific Northwest. Was it the Azalea Festival, the Rhododendron Festival, the Blackberry Festival, or the Tiger Lily Festival? And it looks like we had a question about um, the grounding of the submarine. I think it was actually, so we had a guess that it was 1941. I think it was actually earlier than that. I think it was early, early 1900s, um, 1910, 1915, something like that. Um, but it was pretty early on. Any guesses? So we have a guess for the Blackberry Festival, which it's about that time of year now that all the blackberries are getting ready for picking. The Rhododendron Festival, we got a guess for that. Any other guesses? All right. So the answer is the Rhododendron Festival. So Eureka is not the only one that has a Rhododendron Festival. Um, there's also Rhododendron Festivals, I believe, up in Oregon. Um, and this is a super popular festival. It was kind of a bummer it got canceled this year, though totally understandable. But the, um, the floats that are featured in the festival parade um, are all decked out with uh, rhododendrons. As you can kind of see in this picture here with some uh, very excited looking Boy Scouts. <laughs> um, and it looks like, oh man, I'm having a hard time reading what date that is on the sign. Um, but it was, uh, had to do with uh, kind of a Boy Scout event that was happening at Redwood Acres. Um, and you'll notice there's quite a few rhododendrons around Eureka. Um, there was a lady named Amelia Carson, who I may have mentioned previously, um, but she lived in a house that was where the Times Standard Building is now. And I believe she had a pretty notable collection of rhododendrons of many kinds. Um, and they're a very beloved flower and grow all over the place still today. So I really like them. They're one of my favorites. Uh, the Blackberry Festival is up in West Haven. Um, they sell very tasty blackberry pie along with uh, vanilla ice cream and have really good music. 
I'm assuming it also got canceled this year, but it's something worth checking out. Um, but get there early because the parking is very minimal. All right, so what title does the Humboldt County Fair hold that makes it special from other county fairs in the state of California? It takes place on a local farm. It has the smallest county fair footprint, it is the only county fair with donkey races, or it is the longest running county fair. And if you're unfamiliar with the county fair, this is the one that takes place in Ferndale. Um, I always get it confused with the one that happens at Redwood Acres, um, but this is the one in Ferndale. So go ahead and take a guess and pop it in the comments. Humboldt County Fair. We have a guess for D. Yeah, I remember going to the, we have a guest for C for donkeys. We have another guest for D. Um, I remember going to this fair for the first time and I grew up in San Diego um, with the Del Mar Fair, which is this huge bonanza it takes place over the course of like a month and like a bajillion people go and visit it. Um, and it was really nice to go to the Humboldt County Fair. It's a smaller kind of event, but it's um, it's much more homey and kind of like, older fairs are like. So we have another guest for D. All right, so the answer, if someone say Del Mar Fair is awesome, it's pretty cool. <laughs> I always get lost whenever I'm walking around. All right, so the answer is D. It is the longest running county fair since 1896. Humboldt County Fair has been running. Um, so. Yeah, Humboldt County Fair. So it, it also did get canceled this year. I was kind of bummed. I liked going to see the donkey races because um, that's how they open their racing days. I think all of them with donkey races and it's just something kind of interesting to go see. <laughs> so this next one, this yearly event pictured below was popular in the early to mid 1900s and celebrated a notable sol soldier stationed at this local military fort. Was it Fort Gaston, Fort Humboldt, Fort Bragg, or Fort Lincoln? <laughs> and this is a photo from HSU's special collections. So pretty much all of these old timey photos are from the Clark Museum, except for when they're labeled as elsewise or otherwise. So Fort Gaston, Fort Humboldt, Fort Bragg, or Fort Lincoln? Dun, 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 dun. We have two guesses for B. You might also recognize the building in the back, but I'll talk a little bit about that. We got someone, we got a vote for C. Couple guesses for C, a couple guesses for B. It's kind of, it's almost a little split, leaning a little more B. So it is actually B, Fort Humboldt. Um, Ulysses S. Grant was stationed at Fort Humboldt for a time. And um, then at a later date, and I haven't been able to find the origins of what is called Days of General Grant. Um, I haven't really found the origins of that celebration, but people would dress up in old timey clothes and kind of parade around. We have a couple of pictures of um, bank staff dressing up for the event. So I'm not really sure what's going on or where it started. And the building in the background there with the dome and the pillars um, is what's now the Morris Graves Museum of Art. That was used to be the Carnegie Library, which has its own really fun history. I might have to talk about that at some point. Um, but check out that, uh, that carriage there, that stagecoach, says you know says the Bank of Eureka on it. So that was probably, if that's not the original one, a reproduction of the stagecoaches that would bring um, money to Humboldt County from places like San Francisco. So pretty cool picture. I was excited to find this one. So next one, this holiday once was once known as Decoration Day and features parades of veterans of the Civil War and events at cemeteries. So is it Memorial Day, Veterans Day, Labor Day, or 4th of July? Um, and I just noticed that this is the same picture I used previously. So sorry about that. 
Um, <laughs> so go ahead and take a guess. So if I'm if I'm getting this location right, the fence right in front there is Myrtle Grove, and the dirt road that they're marching on is Myrtle Avenue, but I'm not 100% sure. So we have a guess for B. Um, there's a local historian named uh, Milt who knows a boatload about um, Myrtle Grove and the cemetery there. So he'd probably be able to identify the fence super quickly. We have a guess for A. It's kind of crazy thinking that there were a bunch of dirt roads like that, um, especially when it rains. That would be intense, having to drive on a dirt road in the rain, um, particularly with how much it historically rained here. There's a lot of rain. Probably get stuck pretty easily. All right, any other guesses? Memorial Day, Veterans Day, Labor Day, or Fourth of July? <laughs> Well, thanks for tuning in, Erin. Um, and we hope to see you back at a future event. All right. Anyone else? We'll go ahead and move along. So the answer is Memorial Day. Um, and uh, the parades of veterans I, I mentioned, um, there's a group called the Grand Army of the Republic. G-A-R, and those were made up of, I think generally union um, veterans. <laughs> um, so I see, tried to trick us with the veterans and the questions. Uh, it wasn't intentional, but yeah, I could see how that could be tricky. <laughs> um, yeah, so. This festival's mission is to create intentional, accessible art that enlivens public spaces, stimulates community revitalization, and attracts visitors to Eureka. Is it the Salt and Fog Festival, the Open Studios Festival, Eureka Street Art Festival, or the Samoa Dunes Art Festival? And if you've been in Humboldt County for kind of any period of time, you'll note that this place has a lot of festivals all the time. It seems like in the summer, every weekend, there's a different festival. Um, so might be tricky, might not be tricky. I'm not sure, but there's a lot of, um, a lot of art going on in Humboldt County. So we have a guest for C, Eureka Street Art Festival. Though I was really tempted by A. So <laughs> we had a half guess for A, two guesses for C. All right, so it is C. It's the Eureka Street Art Festival. Um, and this just started two years ago, yeah, two years ago. Um, so the the first street art festival was actually literally right outside here in Old Town. Um, they did, a, there were a bunch of murals that were put up on Opera Alley, which is named after the kind of opera house that used to be in the Carson block, the big red building with the turrets just down the street from us. Um, and then last year they kind of moved a little bit up towards fifth and sixth street. And this year they're gonna be out in Henderson Center painting a bunch of the buildings out there. And it's all different artists. They bring in people from around the world. I think this year it's all gonna be local artists due to the traveling restrictions, which makes total sense, um, but they are still painting. So it'll be great to go out and go check it out. Um, so I wanted to kind of bring some notice to that. This is kind of more of a more recent history. Um, but it's really exciting that all this art is being brought to Humboldt County, especially on such a large scale. And so we had a question about the Salt and Fog Festival. So that's 
that was the ocean festival, right? So that was one that kind of replaced the crab festival. It's one of the earlier ones that we have each year. I think it's, I want to say it's like in June. It's pretty early. Um, and that takes place right on the waterfront. That was a thing that started last year. Yeah, Humboldt made hosted it. The people that run our visitor center hosted it. Open Studios is a thing that happens every summer, I want to say. Probably not going to happen this summer, but it's where all these different artists around Humboldt County open their studios so you can go and check out their work, you know, have some snacks, talk with the artists. Um, and then the Samoa Dunes Art Festival is something that I just made up. <laughs> but they did, there were a bunch of artists that went out and painted some of the metal, not metal, the concrete kind of things out there. I'm not really sure what they are, but they have something to do with like the World War II history of Samoa. They're these weird concrete things and they painted them and they, all, they look really pretty now. So anyway, uh, Street Art Festival, August 10th through 15th. Go check it out. Bring a mask. It's going to be awesome. All right, next category, trains, trains, trains. So if you tuned in, a, yeah, it was probably over a month ago now, definitely over a month ago now. Um, I kind of went on this, uh, I don't know, discussion about trains and how interested I am in trains. So I thought I'd make this a little category for us. Plus there's a ton of train history up here in Humboldt County, even though you might not necessarily be able to see it nowadays. It is still there still present and it's still active. So first question here is the Arcata Mad River Rail Line, which is a mouthful, uh, passed through this town and earned the name Annie and Mary Line from two bookkeepers that worked for the railroad. The Annie and Mary moniker has since turned into the name of a yearly summertime celebration in this same town. Is that Arcata, Eureka, McKinleyville, or Blue Lake? And the picture here is from the Clark Collection. Um, you'll notice that kind of in the background, there's a, um, a sign, it says A, and then the little and sign, M-R-R-R -R -R Depot. That's Arcata and Mad River Railroad Depot. And we have someone who looks like one of the train workers right up front here. So if you wanna take a guess, go ahead and pop it in the comments. Um, yeah. So we have a guess for D. We have a guess for C, but also no idea, but I'll say C, there we go. And each one of these towns has its own kind of interesting train history. So if you are interested in trains, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff to learn. All right, do we have any other guesses? Mm -hmm. So the answer is Blue Lake. So it's funny because the, the Blue Lake Museum is actually a former train depot. It's not this particular train depot that's pictured here, um, but it's kind of a smaller building. It closely resembles the railroad depot in Fortuna, um, but they got a sweet little museum there. And that's, um, I think it's called Railroad Avenue. That's where the Annie and Mary days festival goes on. Um, initially, when I saw Annie and Mary, I thought it was just kind of a um, a nickname for the Arcata Mad River, you know, because Arcata begins with an A and Mad River begins with an M. Um, but it's actually named after the two bookkeepers that worked for the railroad. So it's kind of an interesting little, little tidbit of knowledge. So this organization founded in 1977 is typically known for its collection of trains, although their collection spans far beyond the trains they house. Is it the Eureka Heritage Society, the Skunk Train, the Timber Heritage Association, or Blue Ox? Do, 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 do. Yeah, and, um, I just got a comment here. I love that they named it after their bookkeepers. It, that is pretty cool and didn't, from what I could see, I didn't really figure out why it was named after the bookkeepers, but it's kind of cool that I don't think that usually happened. So something different. So this organization, 1977, 
is typically known for its collection of trains, although their collection spans far beyond the trains they house. I was pretty excited when I visited uh, these guys um, and checked out their trains. Um, it reminded me a lot of visiting the Sacramento Train Museum, which is spectacular if you ever get a chance. Um, I know I didn't necessarily like grow up near trains or anything like that, but it's really something else to stand next to a train and see how big they are. Because you kind of, in your mind, you kind of know that they're pretty big, but they're huge. All right. Any guesses on this one? We got a guess for C. Any guesses? Okay, that was multiple guesses. We have A, C, A, I don't know, A. <laughs> um, so it is actually the Timber Heritage Association. So this is a picture of one of their trains that they have actually out at Fort Humboldt. Um, I just noticed they're using a piece of wood to um, as kind of a stopper for the train rail wheel. But um, so uh, Timber Heritage is a really neat group. They have, they're working on, um, I guess, accepting ownership over what's called the Samoa Roundhouse and Shops, which is behind the Samoa Cookhouse, if you're familiar with that area. Just realized there's a lot of Samoa things going on today in this trivia thing. Um, but the Samoa Roundhouse was where historically the logging company that owned that land would keep their trains. And then you could rotate out which train goes on the track to you know move things around. Um, but of course, due to the um, kind of the impacts of environmental degradation that have happened out there. There's lots of lead paint, lots of chemicals and things used in working on trains and logging historically that um, they're working right now on kind of restoring some of the environmental impacts that have happened out there. So they have not only a bunch of trains and they also have a train that's being worked on um, it's being worked on um, out in Pennsylvania, I think, I wanna say. I'm not sure how they got it out there. That's gotta be one heck of a story. Um, if any of you guys know a THA person, definitely ask them, I'd love to know. Um, and yeah, so they're a pretty neat little organization. Um, if you're interested in learning about trains or particularly lumber history, that's kind of the bulk of what they're going for is preserving local lumber history, which of course trains are a part of that. Um, they're definitely a group to contact. So we have a question, where is the THA? So they're out. Um, so they, they're all volunteers and the museum situation that they have out there is only open to the public on certain weekends in the summertime. And then whenever they do the speeder car rides, which these speeder cars are these little um, cars that would ride the trains and move people from camp to camp. Um, but right now they're not open to the public because of everything that's going on. Um, so to get in contact with them, you'd have to contact them probably through their website, um, or if you know someone who is in THA, you might have to do that. Um, so yeah, they're, they're a great group though. I really like talking with them and seeing what they're doing. They also have collections of um, really uh, incredible looking chainsaws. <laughs> if you're looking to see what kind of um, chainsaws were used to cut down old growth trees. These are the guys to call. We definitely borrowed one of them for our Redwood National and State Parks uh, exhibit, which talked a bit about the logging industry and, and things like that. So they're pretty cool. Blue Ox is also pretty cool. They do tours. I think they might still be closed. The skunk trains out in um, Ukiah, no, not Ukiah. Willits? Oh. I'm having a heck of a time remembering. Um, and the Eureka Heritage Society is here in Eureka. So the, um, yeah, so Timber Heritage, we have a question, are they in Eureka when they're open? They're technically in Samoa. Um, yeah. What fuel was used to power early trains locally? Was it wood, diesel, coal, or pure fury? You could tell I kind of ran out of ideas for this one. Um, and here's a great picture of a train on some trellises. Um, 
And that's pretty incredible looking at how that stuff got built. Um, just this rough hewn wood kind of stuff. <clears throat> and you can see this one's all loaded up. So go ahead and take a guess. <laughs> oh, and it looks like um, the skunk train isn't Willets in case. So we have a guess for coal. We have another guess for coal. I guess a C, but love D, which is, <laughs> I wanted to put an angry picture of Thomas the train on here, but I thought that might not be professional. Um, we have another guess for C. So this is kind of a fun fact, and this was one I learned from drum roll, da -da 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 -da, the Sacramento Train Museum. <laughs> but um, it actually, uh, they were powered by wood. And one way you can tell is by looking at the smokestack here. Um, there might be a more technical name for smokestack, but um, coal powered trains were more of a kind of tube going upward, whereas wood burning ones were this kind of V shape with a narrow opening. And that had to do with when you're burning wood, um, embers kind of fly around and you don't want the embers to fly out necessarily and catch stuff on fire. You want them to kind of bop around inside here um, instead of flying out while they're, while they're still hot. So that's kind of fun. Um, as far as I know too, there weren't too many coal deposits around here and diesel was used later on and that's kind of a more modern fuel for trains. So little fun fact. Now, whenever I see a train and I look at it, that's like the first thing I look at, which is fun. Uh, another fun fact is that we have one of these train headlights that's pictured here. Um, at some point, that'd be fun to uh, bring that thing out on display because I was I was amazed to find that. It's pretty neat. So we have um, someone says they switch to oil burning steam engines locally. Oh, okay. There you go. All right, so this geologically unstable area hosted hundreds of trains during its operating years. You might even say thousands, but I'm not really sure. While the line is no longer in operation, you can still see sections of the line near the bluff pictured here, which is located near the town of Redway, Ferndale, Scotia, or Fortuna. And it's kind of fun um, driving south on 101 um as you follow because once you once you get to about this area if not a little um sooner um the road parallels the eel river following the eel river valley kind of thing and along that entire route pretty much you can see where the train line was at so next time you're driving 101 um and hopefully maybe you're not driving, but someone else is, and you have a chance to look out the window, keep an eye out for some of these rail lines and the old roads as well, because 101 has of course changed over time. And especially because this is a geologically unstable area. Um, it's really cool to see where the old road used to be, where the old railroad used to be. Um, and it's something I like to do while I'm driving south. Um, but, you know, gotta be sure you keep your eye on the road. So we have a couple guesses for C, we have one guess for A. Um, <laughs> Aaron says, I'm so ashamed of my lack of knowledge about my second home. I'm sure if I participated in a trivia challenge for my local hometown, I, I would also feel that same way. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's something, one of those things when you're living somewhere, you might not necessarily um, learn a lot about the local history just because you're kind of there, you know, I don't know. I know I don't know much about the town I grew up in, so nothing to be ashamed of. You can always learn. And then we have someone, we have Nate says, keep your eyes on the road, Katie. <laughs> yes, I will. <laughs> I do, <laughs> particularly on 101. It's very windy. All right, so we got Scotia. So here is the picture on the previous slide. And then I also have a picture that I found on the interwebs of the line now. You can kind of see it's overgrown with trees. There are sections where the cliff is just kind of totally demolished um, the rail line, which of course this area flooded in the 1964 and 1955 floods. So the rail line kept getting beat up over time. Um, all right, so 
we have, um, I mean, okay, so we have two comments here. We got, it's the Scotia Bluffs built by Pacific Lumber Company in 1884 became Northwestern Pacific Railroad as of 1914. Yes, uh, definitely. And then we have a question that says, was it still running in the 64 flood? So the 64 flood um, did a good bit of damage. Um, so we have another comment that says, yes, it was still running. Um, I'm guessing it did get damaged though. And that, you know, kind of over time trains became used less in terms of transporting stuff up here from places like San Francisco. Um, so eventually it just kind of went out of usage. So, all right. So next one, to finalize the construction of the Northwestern Pacific Railroad, which connected San Francisco and Eureka, the golden spike driving ceremony was planned and staged at this rural locale. Was it Fort Seward, Cane Rock, Alder Point, or Falk? We have two pretty great pictures here. The center one, or the kind of the first one, that says Golden Spike. That's a picture of the Golden Spike. Um, and it's in what looks like a redwood burl box, which is pretty cool. And then the picture on the right um, is a picture of the driving of the ceremonial Golden Spike. Um, I believe the guy with the hammer is the owner of the company. And I think the, the young lady is somehow related to him. Um, so we have a guess for B. Um, you can see all the people in the background, which there are some great pictures that are kind of larger and you could see everyone that attended this, this event. Um, I don't think I found any for this presentation, but, uh, Okay, so we got a couple things here. So for um, having to do with uh, the train going through Scotia. So we see it was obliterated in 1955 and 64. The last train ran in 98, um, which is kind of recent. I'm kind of surprised. Um, and then is this the same train that used to run through Eureka? Yes, that was the same train line. And Sean, you might know better than me or not, I'm not sure. Um, but there's some trains that are over by the um, by the Vista del Mar that are kind of abandoned on the tracks there. I heard those were the last trains to run that line, but I'm not sure. We're also, so let's see. So we got a guess for B, and then we got a guess for C, and then we have, she looks like she's wearing kitty PJs, which she really does. I think it's just her hat. It's got some kind of bow on it. Um, <laughs> But she looks so excited. That'd probably be two, though, you know, completing a railroad. That's kind of a big deal. So the answer is Cane Rock. It's way out in the middle of nowhere. It's kind of, um, I've heard people compare it to Promontory Point in Utah, which is where the Transcontinental Railroad was completed, where there just wasn't really anything out there, but it happened to be the place where the railroad met, so they had a big event out there. Okay, and as for the, the trains that are located over by the Vista Del Mar, Sean says, yep, those are ex Southern Pacific GP9 locomotives landlocked here in 1998. Cool, great to know. I'd heard that from someone else and I wasn't really, really sure. So, and David says, do we know when this was? So for the Golden Spike ceremony, this was uh, right here in the corner of this picture on the, um, on the right side here, October 23rd, 1914. So you'd imagine it probably wasn't too easy to get out there. Um, but of course, now you got the rail line, so you could just take people by train out there for the completion of the line. And as far as I know, the Golden Spike, while you know, this was kind of a big ceremony, the um the spike wasn't left out there. I think they took it back and no one really knows where it is now. Um, but we have a replica here at the museum that's not solid gold um, that was used when the rail line was repaired after the 64 flood. And it is actually on display right now too as part of our um, Chinese expulsion exhibit. The Chinese worked on the railroad, so it kind of had a link there. All right, next question. Local flora and fauna. Um, yeah. Plants and animals. 
These flowering plants, which are characterized in the lily family, exist throughout Northern California. They play an important role in local basket weaving traditions. What is it? <clears throat> is it bear grass, maidenhair fern, Queen Anne's lace, or bull thistle? And I've kind of always kept an eye out for this stuff in the wild. I haven't seen it, but I'm also not really a trained botanist or anything like that. So I might have been looking in all the wrong places. Um, but it's kind of kind of crazy looking with all these little flowers on it. So bear grass, maidenhair fern, Queen Anne's lace, or bull thistle. We have a guest for B. <clears throat> kind of pretty flowers though when you really look at them yeah i think the the first time i saw pictures of this i was it looks kind of like a alien plant so we have a couple guesses for c and then david says i learned that at the clark museum <laughs> Right, so this is actually bear grass. Um, maidenhair ferns characterized with, um, it has like a black, I don't know, stems quite the right word for it, that connects kind of the leaves to the rest of the plant, it's black. Um, bear grass is kind of the light tan uh, material that's used in basketry. Sometimes it's dyed different colors, like dyed red with um, red alder bark. Um, but this is kind of the, the bulk of what you see on baskets is bear grass. You also see it on regalia, the bear grass braids. Um, yeah, so. Um, yeah, and then uh, Queen Anne's lace isn't used in basket weaving. Bull thistle looks really cool, but I'm not really sure what local uses there might be for it. It's really spiky looking. It has like purple flowers. It's kind of, kind of looks out of this world. All right, so this next one, this striking bird species formerly lived in Humboldt County until about 1900. There are current movements to reintroduce this bird led by the Yurok tribe. What bird is this? Is it a turkey vulture, a California condor, white striped Northern California eagle, or the bald eagle? <coughs> and you'll notice this one has tags on it. So this was one that was probably raised in captivity um, and then released and is now part of a tracking program. Pretty spectacular, pretty spectacular birds. We have a guest for B. We have another guest for B. And then we have a guest for A. <laughs> and it might be kind of crazy, but looking at one, looking at this bird, <laughs> we have a guest for B. And then we have a guest that says, no, wait. <laughs> um, something that might be kind of shocking is that this bird has a wingspan of about nine feet. So this is a California condor. Um, and we recently brought our California condor back on display. Um, his name is Charlie. So when you come by the museum, because we are open, when you come by the museum, be sure to check him out. Um, he's pretty spectacular. He's kind of near the um, the Lentel map. If you walk in and ask the person at the front desk where the California condor is, they'll point you there that way. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, there is a current program right now to reintroduce the California condor. It's U.S. Fish and Wildlife, the Yurok Tribe, and the National Park Service are all working to um, reintroduce the California condor to the Bald Hills area, which is where it, part of its historical range. And um, these birds uh, were um, pretty much extinct in the wild. The last couple individuals were taken out of the wild back in the 80s, I wanna say. Um, and they were put into captive breeding programs at the Los Angeles Zoo and the San Diego Wild Animal Park, also known as the Safari Park now. Um, and they had a really, really productive um, program to breed these birds in the wild and then be able to release them. And you can go see them in Utah, I think has a couple of them out there, um, and the Grand Canyon. Though you can see them flying around, see them sitting in the sun. It's really incredible. And they're huge birds. They're 
kind of the, you know, one of the biggest birds in this part of the, the world. So definitely exciting. I'm looking forward to seeing these guys flying around. All right, so a short walk along the shores of Humboldt Bay, particularly by the Warfinger building, will usually reveal a flock of these birds flying close to the water in a line. What are they? Greater Tern, Brown Grebe, California Brown Pelican, or Red-Throated Pelican? And during the closures, when I kind of needed a time to get out of the house, but not get out of the house at the same time, I'd drive over to the Warfinger and kind of watch all the birds flying around out there. I saw a bunch of these guys, um, even saw them catch some stuff, so that was a lot of fun. Um, I also saw these other birds that were, um, there's like certain types of birds that kind of do this hovering and diving thing, and that was a lot of fun. Um, um, so good times over at the Warfinger. If you like watching seabirds, it's a great place for it. Particularly now, I think that it's kind of a less busy area because people are kind of going back to work and not as tired about being at home. We have a guest for C. We have a question, where is the Warfinger building? So if you go, if you go on First Street and drive, like you're driving towards Costco, which sounds kind of vague, um, there's like the, the boat docks out there, the public marina, I think is what it's called, um, but it's out that way. There's also these two really big metal boats that are just kind of sitting in an empty field. Um, that's the Warfinger building area. That was where we had our history symposium. We have a guest for D. We have a guest for C. Um, yeah, Warfinger is kind of a, I think it's owned by the city. It's kind of an events venue. People have like prom there. Um, but it's also a great bird watching spot. All right, so it's the California Brown Pelican brown and it's a pelican. The great thing about common names, sometimes they're straightforward, sometimes they're very not like what is a turn, you know, um, but they're pretty cool to watch them fly in a line and catch some fish. So this critter can usually be found in southern Humboldt, although they're very elusive and nocturnal. Due to their cat-like appearance and their affinity for catching small rodents, a common name for them is miner's cat. Is this a raccoon, a ringtail cat, flying cat, or a ringtail lemur? Um, I lived in Soham for a little bit, um, working at the state park down there, and I, I think I saw one of these guys once when I was driving around at night. Um, I saw some two little eyes in the in the weeds, and then they kind of ran off. Um, but I've always wanted to see one of these in person. So we have a guess for D and a guess for B. These little guys are pretty darn cute. I see Ring's tail. <clears throat> and if you ever do want to see one of these like actual size, um, and if you don't mind taxidermy animals, if you go to um, Humble Redwood State Park, their visitor center, they have a taxidermied one of these little guys. Just makes you want to take it home. We have a guess for D. So, let's see. So the answer is ringtail cat. Um, I'm not sure what makes it a cat because it kind of looks like a cat, but also doesn't really look like a cat. Um, the ringtail lemur lives in Madagascar. Um, flying cat. I don't know that there is a flying cat. There's definitely flying squirrels. Those definitely do exist in Southern Humboldt. Um, and this is uh, a very teeny tiny if it was a raccoon, but it's not a raccoon. <laughs> All right, so these shells historically used as money by Native American tribes along the Northwestern coast and into the Midwest, as well as being incorporated into various regalia items were harvested in the area now known as British Columbia. Is it dentalium, uh, tube shells, bird bone shells, or elephant tusk shells? There are flying cats in our house. Oof, that's wild. <laughs> um, and for a size reference for these, um, they might be, 
about two inches long, inch and a half long. You can get bigger ones that are a couple inches long, but most of the ones we see in our collections are kind of the smaller-ish ones, just for size reference, because this is very vague. Got a guess for A, along with, those are all great fake answers. <laughs> I think when I made this one, I might've been tired. <laughs> So dentalium, tube shells, burn bone shells, or elephant tusk shells. <laughs> Any other guesses? Oh, snap. <laughs> we are running behind. Oh, lost track of time. Okay, so this is dentalium. And in case anyone was wondering um, what dentalium critters look like, that's what they look like. Um, pretty crazy looking. <laughs> um, that's what they look like in their shells. And this is an example of dentalium shell usage in regalia um, into North Dakota. So this is a lady named Teresa Yellow Lodge, who was possibly Lakota, lived in North Dakota um, with all kinds of dentalium shells on um, kind of this dress that she's got going, these hair um, hair pieces, pretty incredible, even on kind of this, um, the sleeves of her dress as well. And it was used as money. Um, people here locally had tattoos on their arms to measure the length of shells or strands of shells in terms of estimating uh, payment for items. And it, they appear all over different regalia items as well. And we have a question, are they like mantis shrimps? I don't think they are, um, but they definitely look like them. Uh, it looks like a less scary, smaller cousin of the mantis shrimp. <laughs> okay, last, I think this is our last category, parks. So we might run a little over today. Um, time got away from me. Okay, this section of forest in Fortuna was once considered a prime candidate for a park reserve. However, it was logged before it could be saved. Was it Carson Woods, Roner Park, Newburgh Park, or Headwaters Park? Might have to do a lightning round on this one. Forest in Fortuna. It was gonna be a reserve, but then it was logged. Dun, dun, dun. And there is still a road that has this uh, location's name on it. Although I think the forest is mostly not there anymore, unfortunately. Um, so the answer is Carson Woods. We're doing a lightning round, so <laughs> sorry if you were still guessing. Um, and this is a picture of a group of people out at a tree in Carson Woods. Um, W.J. Bryan, wondering if that's, wonder who that is. But anyway, um, uh, Roner Park is, uh, I think that's a different park in Fortuna, or that's the one over by Sonoma. Um, Newberg, Newberg Park is in Fortuna and Headwaters is here in Eureka. It almost got logged, part of it got logged, but the rest of it was saved and that was later, that was in the 90s. All right, so this trail in Humboldt Redwood State Park is named after a Eureka woman who is believed to be the first white woman to participate in direct action to stop logging in the county. What's the trail called? Is it Julia Trail, Mayhan Loop Trail, Addie Johnson Trail, or Albee Creek Trail? And this photo here is from the Humboldt Redwoods Interpretive Association. This, I believe, is the Burlington Campground, right when you get to the visitor center there. So, all right, make your guesses. So the answer is Mahan Loop Trail. This is a picture of Laura Perot Mahan. She's one of my personal heroes. Um, she was a local lady whose husband was an attorney and she had gone down to what is now called Founders Grove. And 
um, saw that Pacific Lumber, who was not supposed to be logging that area because it was under consideration for a park, was putting a railroad spur through the area. Um, so she hopped up next to a redwood tree that they were about to cut down and told them to not cut it down um, while her husband ran up to Eureka to file an injunction against the company, which did work and they stopped logging. But if you go on um, the Mayhan Loop Trail, you can still see some stumps in an otherwise old growth forest. So pretty cool, um, pretty cool lady. Um, people don't talk too much about her. They're starting to talk a little bit more about her. Um, if you read the book, um, Woman Who Saved the Redwoods, she shows up in it a little bit. Um, and she was quite the lady. And Addie Johnson, I think how she got famous was she was the first um, white woman settler to, to die in that area of um, uh, Southern Humboldt. But I think she died from natural causes. I don't think she was murdered or anything. Um, but I'm not 100% sure. You never really know. This plot of land was donated to the city of Eureka in 1894 by Bartland and Henrietta Glatt and later became Carson Park, Sequoia Park, Old Town Plaza, or Hammond Park. And these are some pictures from the Clark Collection. Um, the one on the right I hadn't seen before, it looked like they just took some fallen logs and turned it into walkways, um, which is pretty cool. Pretty neato. Um, and then the one on the left here, it looks like they just kind of built some steps into a dirt hillside. And it's, you know, very likely that those steps are still there. Um, so we have a guess for B. Um, and this is a pretty neat park in the city of Eureka. I know lots of people go to it today. We have another guess for B. Oh, wait, it's the same guess, same person guessing. Um, all right. So the answer is Sequoia Park. Um, and here's two other additional pictures of Sequoia Park. It looks like everyone seems to have gotten that one. <laughs> um, so there's the water fountain at Sequoia Park on the left there. And then on the right, there's kind of these small buildings that were kind of around Sequoia Park. I'm not really sure what happened to those. It's something I kind of want to look more into because they those little buildings show up all over the place. I think they might've been like picnic table areas. Um, and actually, so we see someone say, because there was, because we know there's no Carson Park. There is actually a Carson Park. Um, it's between H and I streets and Henderson. Sorry about the phone ringing. Um, I was kind of worried that might happen. <laughs> um, so there is a Carson Park and there is a Hammond Park as well, I believe. Um, anyway, so this park once featured a CCC camp located near its namesake feature. Was it Prairie Creek Redwoods State Park, Patrick's Point State Park, Tallawa Dunes State Park, or Del Norte Redwoods State Park? This is a great picture on the on the right here. Um, it's a lady standing and looking up at a humongous redwood tree. Um, I'm pretty sure all of us, when we first came to Humboldt County or grew up here, we all have a picture next to some huge, huge old redwood tree. Um, I definitely still have my picture, I, though I don't remember where I took it in, uh, in the parks. So go ahead and take a guess. Lightning round, lightning round. All right. So we have a guess for B. Um, we have a guess for A. So the answer here is Prairie Creek, Prairie Creek Redwoods. And this is another picture of Prairie Creek. Um, and something that's kind of interesting about this one though that I noticed while I was putting this together is that this elk has a bell around its neck. So I'm not really sure what's going on here. Um, 
but I'm pretty sure on the other side of this is a postcard, the other side of this postcard, um, there's a note um, on these people visiting Prairie Creek and sending this postcard to a friend of theirs. But yeah, the visitor center that's now there was um, CCC housing um, in the 30s during the depression. Um, I think it was the housing for the person who was in charge of the camp and then the rest of the camp was out in the prairie. And there are some really cool aerial pictures of that, which I remember seeing, I used to volunteer at Prairie Creek, but I don't remember where those pictures were stored at. So I wasn't able to include them this time around. All right, I think this is the last question for this round. This village constructed by members of the Yurok tribe to educate younger generations on traditional house building styles is also used today for ceremonies and other cultural building events. Is it Shirai, Surai, Sumeg, or Oric? We got this great picture of the redwood plank houses. Um, and we have an example of one of these houses. It's kind of a mini version um, here in the museum. And I think, oh, I remember talking to a guy, there was a guy who was posting on one of our Facebook posts saying that he helped build these houses. And I think he was the one that helped build the, um, the model house that we have as well. So we have a guess for D. Um, and these houses are particularly cool because um, you can go in them. So while it is a culturally sensitive area, there are parts of the this area you're not supposed to go in, you can go in the houses and see what the structure is like. Um, and that's something that's really special. And there is also, so there's, there's a sweat house there that no one can go into unless you're there for ceremony. And then there's one that if you're visiting, you can go in to see what it looks like on the inside. So those are also at this place, which is really cool. Um, and it's a, great, it's a great addition to help educate the public what these village home sites are like, um, the role they played in you know, village life for Native Americans in this area. So we have two guesses for D and then one for B. So the answer is Sumeg. So this is actually out in, um, Patrick's Point State Park. <clears throat> and it's close enough that um, you can either drive in or you can park outside and walk in um, and see these houses. And they do occasionally have ceremonies there. Some are open to the public, so keep an eye out for that. I don't think they're going to have any this year due to COVID, um, but keep an eye out. Um, it's a pretty neat spot to visit. So now is your chance to tally up. Um, and I'll just uh, while you're kind of doing that, um, I think Dana is also going to tally up um, and we can be in contact with whoever got the most answers right. Um, so with that, I want to say thanks for tuning in. Um, I hope you had a good time. I hope you learned something. Um, and I don't know, I hope, I hope this was a, a good time. So a couple of things. Oh, okay, so we have the, the answer, tally is in. Dana says the winner by one guess is Nate. Yay, Nate, you get a, you get a membership to the Clark, woo! So you can go ahead and send us um, a message with you know where we should send your membership. Um, so you can either send it to the Clark Museum page or Dana will contact you. So thanks for participating. Um, I guess Dave was close, close, but not quite. Anyway, I hope you had a good time. A um, couple announcements, we are open. Um, we opened on Wednesday, so we're open Wednesday through Sunday, nine to four. Um, occasionally things do change. So if you're coming by and you just wanna be doubly sure that we're here, you can always give us a call, 707-443-1947, um, which you can also find on our website, on our Facebook page, social media, all that. Um, you can also check out our website for more information on our frontline worker private tours or to book a private tour if you are a frontline worker um, or know someone who is, be sure to um, send them that way. We've already had a couple books, so it is getting to be kind of popular. So be sure you sign up sooner rather than later. Um, and then also be sure to follow us on social media for updates, behind the scenes work, coming ex exhibitions and virtual events, trivia Thursdays, which are coming soon. 
um, and more. So keep an eye out. Um, be sure you check us out. And also, um, thanks for tuning in. Be sure to share, you know, donate, become a member, um, and help us continue serving the public. So thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, and I hope you all had a good time. And we will see you next week on Ask the Curator. If you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to contact us through our Facebook page. Um, thanks again, and we will see you soon.